Buildings and Homes for Denver's Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. And I, let's see, this meeting is just to center all of our thinking is the third meeting of the electrific commercial electrification working group. This working group is working to refine space and water heating electrification code proposals that will then go back to the full IECC code committee for a vote in July. So thank you all so much for your time to help us really get these proposals ready for the full code committee to vote on in July. I saw a lot of folks pop in. So again, this is the third meeting out of four. We hope to wrap up all of our work in your next meeting. So hopefully we're getting to the point where we know all the changes we need to make. We're getting pretty close uh, coming out of today's meeting and we'll meet one more time in two weeks and hopefully finalize things. So let's go through introductions, uh, starting with the climate office, Courtney. Hi everyone, um, I'm with Casser on the buildings and homes team and I focus on uh, net zero energy for new buildings and homes um, and I've been very involved in the code process to this date. Thanks, Courtney. Let's go through the CPD team. Chuck, you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. I'm with uh, CPD. I'm the, with the Mechanical Plumbing Plan Review team. Thanks, Chuck. Joshua? I'm Josh Armstrong. Uh, I work with Chuck Mechanical Plumbing Review team. Great. Antonio? Hello, everyone. Antonio Navarro, Senior Building Inspector, City of Denver. Thank you. Let's go through all of our stakeholders now. So I'll just run through the list. I think it shows me alphabetically in teams. So we'll go with Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm a consultant to the City of Boulder uh, Housing Authority on construction issues, uh, working as owner's representative on several projects, new and renovations. Thanks, Eric. Aaron Esling. I am a product manager for Excel Energy. I am the uh, business new construction product manager. Great. Mark Jelinski. Hello, I'm a chief mechanical engineer for RMH Group, a mechanical electrical consulting design firm. Thanks, Mark. Mike Reynolds. Uh, Mike Reynolds, owner's rep, Nava Real Estate. Thanks, Mike. Teresa. Teresa Gray, I'm an electrical engineer with Ramirez Johnson Associates. We are also an MEP firm. Thanks, and Libby Coleman. Uh, yep, a project manager with Group 14 uh, Energy Efficiency and Sustainability Consulting for Sustainability. Thank you, Libby. Sean, do you wanna say hi? Hello everyone, Sean Denniston with New Buildings Institute. We're the technical advisor to the city through this process. And I'm just going to highlight now, my daughter has a graduation event this afternoon, so I'm going to have to switch to phone partway through and then disappear while everyone celebrates her. <laughs> Yay. Sounds good, Sean. Did I miss anyone? I think I got everybody on the list, but this is a particularly big group. Uh, I just saw Christine Brinker join us. Christine, do you want to say hello? Yes, hi everyone. Christine Brinker with Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. Great. And Robert Pruitt. Hi, this is Robert. Sorry about that. Uh, combination Inspector, City of Denver. Thanks, Robert. Did I miss anyone? Okay. So today we're going to focus on domestic hot water electrification and I'll pass it to Sean to walk through the proposal. This group you'll recall we haven't spent much time on domestic hot water before but we did discuss it some in our first meeting where we really focused on identifying some of the issues and so we did, Sean has gone through and attempted to address the issues that were expressed during that first meeting but we didn't go deep. So Sean's going to walk through the way we've addressed some of the issues that 
were raised in the first meeting, and then we hope to really refine and hone what we think is an achievable step for the electrification of um, hot water systems in and domestic hot water for commercial and multifamily buildings in Denver uh, for this code cycle. And the one thing I'll remind everyone of, just as you're thinking through the proposal, the thing that we've really been asked to do by Denver City Council is to make sure new buildings are leading the way. And you'll recall that the Energize Denver ordinance does require individual system with a tank hot water heaters to become to, to move to be all electric starting in 2025 where it's cost effective so a lot of those sort of simple individual system with a tank water heater system will in existing buildings have to be all electric when they're replaced starting in 2025 and so we're really looking at how we can make sure new buildings are leading and doing at least as much as what existing buildings will be required to do in 2025 because this code will still sort of be in force there will be buildings still um, uh, starting operations in 2025 under the code we put into law this fall so go ahead with that sort of just background and uh, centering for our thinking go ahead and take it away Sean all right thank you and looks like we'll really get to test the noise cancellation in teams as evidently it is flight day over our house we've had jets and prop planes and everything so as you can see we've made extensive changes to this proposal extensive enough that i just wanted you to see that yes we've made extensive changes i think it would be better for us to just look at this in simple markup so that it makes a little bit more sense um, because it becomes a lot easier to read at that point and i'm also going to get it so that it's not split up all right can everyone see it all right do i need to adjust it all Well, if I do, just let me know. So as Katrina said, the primary intent of these modifications is to align the requirements for new construction with the requirements that we will be seeing for existing building alteration equipment replacements in the near future through Energize Denver. And so it is a fairly straightforward approach where fossil fuel and electric resistance, instantaneous and storage water heating equipment are effectively prohibited prohibited with specific exceptions. So let's start with that, what is actually covered. So the electric resistance, fossil fuels, so fossil fuel of course will cover natural gas and propane, and then instantaneous and storage water heating. So this would not cover boilers or anything that uses an indirect um, storage tank with a boiler. The, the terminology used here is the terminology that's used in the equipment efficiency tables. So someone who has been going through the code and is familiar with the efficiency requirements in the code will see familiar language. The exceptions are targeted to align with Energize Denver, plus also just think about a couple of you know specific things. Uh, so we see we want to be clear that electric resistance heating elements that are integrated into heat pump water heaters are not being prohibited and are not impacted on this because pretty much all heat pump water heaters have some level of electric resistance in them as backup or supplement. Um, it doesn't apply to electric water heaters with a rate of storage volume of not more than 20 gallons. So these are called you know, pony or low boy water heaters uh, there there aren't good heat pump water heater alternatives to these the loads are pretty small you might see this on uh, you know serving an individual lavatory in a commercial building um, or perhaps in a kitchenette and since it's a small load it makes sense to just exclude it and not complicate things and then number three mirrors what we see in energized denver which is if you do electric resistance then you have to do 100 percent of the annual service water heating um, the, the annual load. And so this language is modeled on a similar exception that we see for high input uh, water heating in our, I mean, in C404, where one of the exceptions is a certain amount of renewable energy. And um, so we've just modeled it on the same language. So again, people see something that is familiar. And then we clarify that if you have an on site renewable energy system to meet this requirement, you can't use it also to meet some other requirement in the code. We don't want uh, any double dipping. And then the last one is water heating systems that 
serve end uses that require um, higher temperature water, over 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we have, as we've discussed before, we're starting to see equipment come onto the market, uh, heat pump equipment that can do this, but we're just starting to see it. We're at early adoption eight levels, so we want to leave more flexibility for this high temperature, really, because these are usually process load applications. They're not building load applications. So it's fairly straightforward. It is highly aligned with Energize Denver, and we want to make sure we're getting the technical details right and all the considerations right. Thanks, John. Let's start with just any clarifying questions, just any questions that you have seeking to understand what the proposal says. And then we'll, we'll get into, does it say the right thing? Okay, let's get into discussion then. Um, What's on your minds as you see this proposal, both in terms of some of the technical details, but also just how um, you've seen systems like the ones that will end up being used with this proposal moves forward, sort of work within projects, um, so if any of your experiences with these in the market. Go ahead. Yeah, Mark. Hi. Um, yeah, question or a comment regarding the, you know, instantaneous. The idea it looks like the idea is we're trying to avoid using resistance instantaneous heaters, um, but then it's accepted for um, you know water volume no greater than twenty gallons. Essentially, if it's an instantaneous water heater, it will have a uh, uh, storage capacity of less than twenty gallons. So maybe if what, what I think what you're trying to do is avoid because what we could do um, is there is such a thing we can buy an instantaneous water here that's very large capacity in order to feed an entire building you know, 30 GPM or so at any one time through a given water heater would be a lot of KW hundreds of KW of of heat. But it'd be less than um, 20 gallons of storage. So if the intent is to prohibit that um, situation, I'd recommend that a KW limit to resistance um, storage or resistance um, heat based on a, you know, minimum water volume be included. I was going to do some quick math here, but conceptually that's what I'm suggesting, because otherwise I could do a, you know, a a large um, instantaneous water heater with uh, 19 gallons of um, internal volume, and it would, it would meet that requirement. In in the past, we hadn't addressed those. This is this has come up because um, the feeling was that um, people wouldn't do that. But um, if we're concerned that people might do that, I think it's probably a fairly simple. I need to double check the the language. Uh, mm -hmm. 12 kilowatt is one of the standard breaking points in the uh, efficiency regulations, so it's a handy one to use. Is that, do you think that's a good one or should we go lower? I know most 20 gallon water heaters cap out at somewhere like 4.5 kilowatts, so we could also place it there. Um, well, um, another way to, let's look at it this way. Um, a 5 GPM water heater needing to heat 80 degrees um, delta T, you know, coming in at, at um, uh, 40 and, and leaving at 120 um, would need 20 kW. That was 5 GPM. 5 GPM is in the neighborhood of what's needed for a, um, you know, public toilet restroom group, maybe, um, you know, four to um, six lavatories it, it do a decent size uh, break room it's the kind of thing that you would in want to put under a counter um and it's reasonable to say that a 5 gpm um, instantaneous water heater is is acceptable so um either by gpm what was the number you use 12 kw okay let me let me work that math backwards um 12 
is a yeah see that's not much that's a one i did something wrong between those two but that's not it's not a large um water heater that's also a that might do a break room it might do a um a smaller group of of you know lavatories in a um tenant finish toilet room so we're, that's all that's on the right um range is what i'm saying 12 to 20 kw somewhere in there is the right number thanks mark and it sounds like sean can dig a little bit more on that and maybe if you have any more thoughts than that eric or sorry sean i can't talk. if you have any more thoughts than that uh, mark please send them to sean offline and we'll get that number kind of refined before this comes back to the group um eric what are you thinking I'm interested in how this uh, code language might play with um, uh, solar thermal used for domestic hot water systems. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of solar thermal utilized in Colorado since about the 1980s. I haven't been successful in um, uh, introducing it on very many pr projects other than my own house. Um, but um, I'm wondering if the exception number three might allow for electric resistance if you had solar thermal do, uh, solar panels doing the bulk of the domestic hot water heating. Uh, if electric resistance backup could make up the distance, the difference on uh, cloudy days or low production days. So. Would systems like these be? Do you think you, we, we would see systems like these in commercial or multifamily buildings? Well, good, good question. Um, I think they're quite possible. Um, there's all kinds of issues with solar thermal uh, tank location, uh, heat exchange tank location, the size of the panels, the location of the panels, visibility of the panels. Uh, nevertheless, we live in uh, a climate that lends itself very nicely to solar thermal. Um, I think in other parts of the country, it's used much more extensively, including in Hawaii, where I think it's actually uh, greatly encouraged or even mandated. So um, if solar thermal were to become more active as an industry, I'm just wondering if this code um, would um, allow that to happen. Would there be a reason not to back up solar thermal with like a heat pump water heater? Is it just a matter of capital expense? I think it is a matter of capital expense Two sort of two systems. Um, I, and I'm using as an example my own house, just a single family home in North Boulder, where I do have um, solar thermal doing a lot of our hot water heating and electric resistance is the backup. So it's it's maybe not a good, uh, it's not maybe not transferable to multifamily commercial that well. Still the question arises, will we see more solar thermal and can we accommodate it? Can the group think of a production threshold that for solar thermal, we might be able to say um, electric resistance for buildings where the service hot water annual load is X percentage served by a solar thermal system. And I would love to have a real world example to offer uh, just based on my own system, but I get remarkably little information from the simple system that I have as far as um, the percentage uh, of hot water that I'm producing via solar. So I don't have a percentage to throw out there uh, for a single family, um, but it's a, it would be a good start to have that. Mark, do you have a recommendation? Um, yes, and that is, um, first of all, I, I 
definitely concur with the fact that if there's um, solar on here, it ought to get credit. And the it's a cost issue because you've already put money into this solar. Um, the idea is to, you know, the the backup, the less hours is simple electric resistance. However, what I what I might suggest here is that this is intended to be the easy button, um, the mandatory prescriptive path. If you did want to go with um, solar, maybe it's not a bad thing to push it into the modeling path. Um, we do, by the way, as far as commercial and what comes up, um, we, we do see it. It's actually mandated in to address within uh, GSA buildings. It has not proven out um, especially in in competition to PV. We're already required to do PV and that's hey solar, right? Um, so it, it you don't it doesn't uh, pencil out rare, rarely does it pencil out in in with with our uses, especially in something other than large hot water uses like um, rec buildings and um, you know that sort of thing your basic office building no. Uh, multifamily, yes. Thanks. It sounds like Sean has some ideas. I'll let you finish typing, Sean. And I know we can always dig a little bit more and have Sean digging a little bit more on this um, to make sure that solar. Uh, are there anything you want to add on that, Sean, before I sort of move us on to a new topic or any other questions you have? OK. No, I, th I think the language is fairly straightforward. It's just a question of what's what's the right threshold yeah. for a solar thermal system where the solar thermal is doing enough where we're OK having it backed up by electric resistance. Yeah. So that sounds good. So I would. I'd like to move us on unless you have something you really want to add, Eric. I see your hand is still up, but I think it was probably just from the solar thermal conversation. Um, yeah, Chuck, do you want to introduce another topic? And I know then a couple things that came up in our first discussion on this that I'll just bring up if someone doesn't, but go ahead, Chuck. You'll probably so go there. I'll add to the last topic. Um, yeah. Just looking at um, that exception, it says for on-site renewable energy system. So it seems that there could be a sort of a combination because you could get credit for the solar thermal water heating and then maybe deduct that from the required solar PV that would offset that um, electric resistance um, and maybe require a minimal amount of PV when you provide solar thermal instead of the whole, the whole uh, electric sure. resistance. Um, and then uh, on that, uh, you know, with the heat pump water heater partnered with a solar thermal system is probably a, an ideal setup because of the um recovery rate associated with heat pump water heaters isn't as good as with gas and so pre-tempering the water is is a great way of uh partnering the systems so it, i think we should definitely encourage the heat pump with uh, the solar thermal um but moving on to the next topic was looking at um this i didn't see any For the for the required split systems for the heat pump water heating, I didn't see any temperature ranges that would need to be considered because um, I know a lot of these larger systems require a uh, they're not a it's not a package heat pump and there's a remote condenser and from what I've read is that most the uh, most of the equipment provided today top out at stop producing hot water around 40 degrees. And I know there's a couple companies like Colmac, I believe in out of Washington uses carbon dioxide as a refrigerant and can go to lower temperatures, but that's a, um, a unique or it's not a common system. So um, I would just ask that, how are those split systems going to be considered in this proposal? Yeah, that sounds good. And just Sean, while we still have you sitting in front of your computer, can you speak to how often split systems would be the substitute for these storage water heating uh, systems and an and answer to Chuck's question? And then also, I was going to tag you before you stepped away from your computer to just be on the phone to speak about 
how some of the other issues that the group raised in the first discussion of this around venting of cold air and around noise um, are addressed in the electrification readiness proposal that is moving before the committee separately because I think there is some answers in there at least on like the venting of cold air it should go into like exhaust air and things like that um, but you can you speak to just how that is treated there and I don't know if you have any thoughts on the sort of noise front if we there's anything else that might need to be included here around how they, how these systems are installed not just how the space is sure so them. the split system heat pump water heating systems right now are primarily replacements for boilers so they're they're larger capacity systems and those aren't addressed here there is probably some overlap between very large tank storage water heaters and split system However, in the future, um, we are hearing that some people do like the idea of a more domestic sized heat pump water heater that is a split system to just get the compressor outside. It's just easier to deal with it that way. Um, but we're not seeing that wide scale right now. That's just something that might happen in the future. If it does, I don't think it's going to be an issue because those will be purpose built to replace storage water heaters. So I don't think that the split system is really a big issue because of they are meant to serve central water heating systems as opposed to these more individual storage and instantaneous systems um, unless anyone can think of some specific applications we've certainly not seen that in the design so far but if we need to address it then then we can discuss it in terms of noise and cold air you know since this is just for individual systems you know the probably the biggest concern would be in multifamily, where you would have in unit heat pump water heaters and in those cases both noise and cold air are always manageable um you just they're manageable through design solutions you can't just oh i had a closet that had a you know electric water heater in it and now it's going to be heat pump water heater it's if the system is small and you can't manage the noise just through distance kind of like you can in some single family then you might venting to the exterior is sometimes an opportunity uh, venting to an unconditioned space venting directly into the hvac system itself is an option and these because these heat pump because heat pump water heaters pretty much all come with optional venting kits you have a lot of venting options for how you vent them and once you vent them then you can you deal with both the cold air stream and um, the noise at the same time and i'm going to switch over so i can walk out the door um chuck just to follow up because i've introduced a few points there does that make sense to you on split systems or do you think that very many of these storage water heating equipment would switch to a split system where we need to really address that. I think when you're looking at smaller individual systems, like if you like an apartment building, if each unit is served by a small water heater, then the split system isn't as big a concern. But like Seattle right now is leading sort of leading the way with uh, heat pump water heaters, et cetera. And, they have a, a great series that address some case studies of how they've uh, been successful in multifamily. And most of their case studies are split system water heaters that, you know, systems that serve, you know, five or six units vertically um, and then throughout the building. So there's multiple systems um, and they, you know, have the remote condenser located in the garages or on the roof, et cetera. Now their climate's a little different than ours, but it definitely does go below 40 degrees. And so um, that's why they've been putting it in the garage. But when you look at the central systems that will serve a building, those larger systems will always be a um, split system. Yeah, that's right. I think, and I think the trick is because Energize Denver doesn't address the larger systems until 2027. We tried to structure this so that it also doesn't address the larger systems, but I'm wondering, do you see a way where we could gracefully, like, I, I don't know what it would be, right? Incentivize some of that while not saying you can never put in another central hot water system with a boiler, because that seemed to be going too far to the group in our last conversation. So maybe I should ask the question again, like, 
is that actually going too far? Um, we tried powering it back a bit to try to just move those smaller gas systems to be electric heat pumps. Thoughts on that, Chuck or others? Yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be curious to see what the um, energy savings are going from a large system to a small system using heat pumps and what the advantages are disadvantages because you're going to have a lot of thermal storage in when a central system is what's, what's going to be required um yeah but the temperature this is basically saying you can still just put in that central system using gas because it's not regulating those at all right well this doesn't specify the minimum or maximum size. Well, I guess it does have a minimum on 20 gallons, but anything over 12, 20 gallons is going to be required to be heat pump. Ah, uh, or... maybe Sean can just clarify the intent here because maybe the language isn't clear. I think we were not trying to say that large central storage systems would be covered, but Sean, do you want to clarify if you are back with us? I realize Sean is sharing. We should probably have switched who is handling the sharing. Sean, are you there to stop sharing and to chime in? Are you maybe he's still in transition? Okay, let's go to Libby and we'll circle back to that check once. Hopefully, we have Sean back. Let me see if I can stop his sharing. Yeah, I think getting the clarification on those large central domestic hot water systems would be great um, and agree that they should not be required to be electrified at this point in time because, like we know, they are not at near cost parity um, or, you know, cost effectiveness as Energized Denver defines it. Um, but I think to your point of trying to incentivize it, because with our experience with multifamily buildings, is that to avoid this need to electrify their individual water heating systems, they're going to centralized water heating systems, um, also preparing themselves to future-proof the building for electrification requirements down the line. Um, but a way to incentivize would be to um, potentially start the incentivization of hybrid water systems. So heat pump as your primary heating source with allowing natural gas backup. Um, we're seeing that as a design, um, kind of creative de design solution to address the main heating with still allowing some natural gas backup. Thanks, that's helpful. And we do plan to offer, and we, we're offering new building electrification incentives. Um, right now and so that's really helpful in terms of feedback around what we should be looking for um or what kinds of projects might have a lot of value right now is the those kinds of projects john are you back where you can hear us on a phone just going to keep checking. Go ahead, Mike. I think you're muted. Mike, uh, you're still operator muted. Error. Oh, there we go. Oh. oh, no, Mike, you're still muted. Oh, there you go. Uh, is it, exception number three on there is the intent with that to say that we can put in an electric uh, water heater, so no heat pump, call it a 40 gallon. Um, we could put those water heaters in if we've got the rooftop solar PV capacity to power those. Is, is, is that my understanding the exception number three correctly with, with that? I, I don't know if that make, makes sense or who the right person to ask is, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, that seems like a good for the the quest the the issues raised of, of noise and and where to vent it. Um, if that could be avoided by doing an electric only tanked water heater, uh, being offset by rooftop PV, um, that that that's the way I read exception number three. And I'm just wondering if 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 that's how it's interpreted by others. That's how I read it too. Yeah. 
that's great. That sounds like a, a great option. Then I have no idea how much rooftop solar one would need to uh, to to go uh, tanked electric water heaters in every unit. But uh, I suppose that's a, a separate conversation. Okay. Yep. And Courtney, thanks for sharing the document again. I'll check again. Sean, are you are you back where you can hear us? I am. Okay, great. We just had a question uh, from Chuck and Libby where the current language seems a little bit confusing. I think we meant to only say that small individual system with a tank water heaters that are gas would not be allowed, but the way it's worded, it's sort of fossil fuels are not allowed for, and I can't, it's a little too small for me to see, Courtney, but it's sort of worded that fossil fuels are not allowed for um, the for any storage, and they thought that could be interpreted to apply to large central storage tanks also. And Courtney, if you can turn off those track changes too, that would be helpful. But yeah, um, is there a way that you think we could clarify that, Sean? So the storage water heater is a specific thing um <clears throat> it's it is a water heater where the tank is integrated into the equipment so if you had a boiler with an indirect uh indirectly heated storage tank that is considered something different under the energy code uh, so as you look at it it should be clear to users because that's the way that the code talks about the equipment right now if um, we could be more explicit to just say that boilers with, um, we could just be say that indirect storage systems are exempt. Um, you know, it's it's not necessary, but if it provides clarity that makes people more comfortable, then the the redundancy could be worth it. Yeah, Chuck, do you think that would be helpful? Clarity or Libby, both of you had mentioned that. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. And Sean, yeah, the term. I think that, more clarity is never a bad thing. Okay, and what was the term that you said that would be, Sean? Uh, you, you would probably just say indirect hot water storage tanks. Indirect storage water heating equipment. I think we'd just go in the first line, probably, Courtney, right? The in terms of the definition of equipment. You would probably want to put it as an exception rather than because I think the length. Oh, of the I see. It would be a new a exception for indirect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And indirect is the so term for the big central water storage tanks. And is indirect also yeah, the term the because often the way I or one of the ways we've seen water heat configured in multifamily properties is that kind of configuration you were talking about, Chuck, where you have one tank serving five or six units now, and it's probably a split system. Um, and so, is that all? Would that also be indirect? That is technically an indirect storage system. You, yeah. But you pretty much only see them with split system heat pumps and. But they're boilers. with heat pumps, so it's not what we're trying to prevent, right? Just double check. Yeah. Okay. So we'll add indirect. Thanks, Courtney. Um, just to be clear. Other thoughts and comments? How are folks feeling in particular? Because I think the big question that came up last time was the questions around noise and cold air. Do you feel satisfied given that these can be, you know, the things that Sean said, these can be designed for and, you know, solving one tends to solve the other? Are you feeling like that fits with your experience? I know a few of you have worked on projects that put these in. Um, anything else there or in, or otherwise? Yeah, Mike Reynolds. I'm just wondering real quick why the instantaneous electric hot water heater got ruled out. Is there, do you just need way too much capacity for those systems? I, I, I don't know, they don't have enough experience to know if they're 
good option, bad option, or otherwise, but I'm just wondering why we're excluding them from being an option on the table. I think that we're trying to make sure we don't run people's electric bills really high. Electric resistance really runs up electric bills, so that's why um, we're trying to create sort of disincentives for that or make sure those are small systems. But do others have thoughts on if that's the right solution and other reasons why? One important consideration is is that they are part of Energize Denver. So if they get installed now, they'll have one service life cycle before they'll have to be replaced. And then you're looking at a, a retrofit for the building to get something else in there. And since instantaneous systems are often small, that could be problematic for them. So for multifamily, if you don't want to go the, the common route, you basically have a heat pump water heater or you've got electric resistance tanked with solar PV on the roof. Kind of or a central boiler. The central boiler is still an option, kind of that, that classic approach, which, you know, it's it's not used a lot in, in low rise, but it's it's it can be used in low rise and it's pretty standard for mid rise and high rise. Certainly struggled with that in high rise, but uh, that'll be a conversation for another day. But uh, OK, sounds good. Anything, well, no, I don't mean I, I don't mean central heat pump water heater, but central a central gas boiler. Correct. Are, are you saying that you you struggle with high rise multifamily central gas boiler? Yeah, there's a number of ways to do that, and uh, yeah, don't need to get into the details. But um, it's just been a in terms of balancing and uh, a repair and, and other factors involved. That I would generally encourage owners to stick with the. Uh, the tanked water heater in each unit rather than the complexity it depends on building type there's you know a lot of factors that go into this but uh just uh just want to know know what the options are yeah that's helpful for for those situations you know you you high rise is a bit difficult because space is such a premium and heat pump water heaters do require more space um but they can be vented to the exhaust ventilation system and and so then you're actually you know, you're, you're handling the noise in the air and you actually even get a little bit of waste heat recovery so I mean, there, there are some options there if you still want to stick individually even with high rise hmm. that sounds like that's kind of what mike was thinking he's nodding um chuck go ahead so looking at exception number two and three how do those play together? So if we have like a electric water heater with it's less than 20 gallons, do they also, that's, a, that's res, electric resistance, do they also need to provide the solar as part of number three? Right now they're standalone exceptions. So, you know, if it's either small or you provide the annual on-site renewable energy. So it, it's either or. I mean, if you wanted to do both, you could do both, but the, the code requirement would only require you to do one or the other. Each of the exceptions should be seen as standalone situations. Okay. And then point of use electric water heaters, those are like labs serving in well, like, you know, restrooms, etc. Those would fit under number two. Of the under right, 20 because gallons. they're technically, yeah, they're technically instantaneous. They're under 20 gallons. And if they're true point of use, then they're going to be way under 12 kilowatt. Yeah. Okay. Or, or okay. 5.4.5 if we decide that that's a more appropriate threshold. Yeah. Anything else, Chuck? Go ahead. Not for now. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Keep thinking through it. Eric? I wanted to go back to your question about. Um, the uh, issues of cold air and noise from in-unit uh, packaged heat pump water heater systems, because I brought that up a couple of meetings ago and uh, from a real world experience up here in Boulder. Um, and I do feel there are design solutions, as mentioned, um, uh, where instead of just plugging this into a closet where you would ordinarily put a resistance water heater, you have to think a little bit more about it. Um, I think someone mentioned that there's vent kits 
that go with these. And uh, it only makes me wonder if you're going to an unconditioned space um, within the building, are there issues with heat, uh, with uh, fire dampers going through rated assemblies to to gain that air and then exhaust that cold air? Um, the best hope I would think would be the uh, if there are individual split systems coming, which apparently aren't here yet, but are on the horizon um, to enable condensers to go um, in a completely separate location. Mm. Thanks, Eric. Sean, do you know the answer to that or others? Yeah, Mark, go ahead if you wanted to chime in with that answer. If not, let's wait for somebody to answer that. Yeah, I got uh, the answer to that more or less. First of all, I think it's already been stated and true that uh, there's not a lot of split systems out there. Another thing about the split systems, by the way, is that many of them have the um, domestic water heat exchanger the as part of that outdoor unit. So you would be taking the out the domestic water to the outdoors, heating it there and then bringing it back in. And that's very problematic in our climate, of course. Um, there are a few coming out that are just the condenser, in other words, just the compressor rather, and they bring um, uh, refrigerant piping into the building. That is what would be appropriate for our situation, but is very rare um, these days. If if you're not doing that, if you don't put the um, condensing unit or compressor only unit um, outdoors, then you got it. I, I'm going to bring up again that what are we um, buying? We're um, just drawing heat out of the space that this unit is in. Even if you do things like um, exhaust that air to the exterior so that the cold air doesn't impact this space, that air still had to come from somewhere. If you take it from the building, that's that much more, several hundred CFM more of exhaust that has to be made up and heated um, by, by the building. Uh, so I, I just caution what are we buying by um, using water uh, heat pump water heaters that draw heat out of the space. And again, remember that the the only way you get a credit for a domestic water um, heat pump under base code C406 is if it doesn't draw um, from the conditioned space. Thanks, Mark. Christine? I wanted to chime in with our experience in our home we haven't noticed any sort of problem with noise or with impacting the um, indoor conditioned temperature and for the results uh, it was a clear slam dunk as far as emissions and and energy use we have an air source heat pump and a heat pump water heater and uh, so the air source heat pump would have to um, uh, heat the space more to make up for the heat pump water heater so they do have effects on each other but still taken as a whole it was a clear win it's not that one offsets the other thanks christine and i think sean you've reflected i think outside of these meetings to me some useful data on sort of the total efficiencies even when the heat pump water heater is drawing its heat from heat created by the heat pump space heater do you want to share a little bit of that with the group Uh, do we still have Sean? We might not. Looks like he had a chance. All right. He reached his time where we had to lose him. But I will try to reflect what he was saying. Um, is just that you still gain uh, is what he uh, has told us a good bit of efficiency, even if um, the heat pump water heater is drawing its heat from air heated by the heat pump space heater. And you do even better if you design like in a multi. Remember, this is for commercial and multifamilies. So if you design, for example, the heat to be drawn from um, the exhaust air uh, so drawn from there and vented to there, then you're doing something more like waste heat recovery even. Um, so you can get some real gains. Some of it may be dependent on design. Anything you'd add from those conversations, Courtney, or does anyone else want to add something on that point? If not, I kind of want to do a temperature check on just like how are we doing on this proposal like we did in our last meeting, but any final words on that or, or other topics? Um, Okay, so can we do the same thing as the last meeting? And I'm gonna have you just put it in the chat because it is actually hard in Teams to see everyone. Um, I would love to do just a quick temperature check 
um, where uh, the number five is you absolutely love this proposal. You think it's the best thing since sliced bread and Denver should move it forward. One is you really just can't live with it. It's not functional and our market's not ready. And three is somewhere in the middle where you think, you know, this is workable um, if we really want to be ambitious about climate solutions. It's not necessarily like your dream proposal, um, but you think it works. Yeah, Chuck, anything you want to chime in on first? Yeah, before we vote, the, the couple things that I think should be included in this proposal yeah. is um, I think we really need to set the guardrails of where it's applicable because I don't think that's super clear currently. Like if we're not going for large central systems, this is for smaller systems. I think we really need to be very clear in that. Okay. And then as far as the supporting information, I think to really gain support, we, we really need to address the energy savings and the carbon savings, obviously, but then also address the the cost of cost comp cost parity to other systems. What it, not only initial installation cost, but also operational cost. What is the difference in operating a heat pump water heater annually versus a gas water heater? And are those in parity when you look at the social cost of carbon or are those in parity without the social cost of carbon? But I think that's the type of um, substantiation and detail that the committee as a whole is going to want to see included as part of this proposal. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. I can pull up the cost studies that are out there that we have a summary of, um, I, but I know we've shared them with the committee before. And so I think that's still, I think you would like more substantiation and I, I definitely hear you on that, Chuck. I also think that um, we have a lot of experience in the market um, represented in this working group. So let's do the kind of just temperature check. Um, I can pull up and then share sort of, and then that's a directional check um, and understanding that we need to make it more clear. This is just for really small systems with checks at it. Um, I can pull up just kind of the general data that we do have on cost and we can share that um, in the follow up. Um, and then I think we'll do kind of a final round of cleanup and I think we can think about what else. Yeah, does the group need to know in your next meeting? Um, we'll also circle back on the space heating proposal in your next meeting. Does that sound good? Okay, so just quick temperature check and people pop in the chat. Five, you love it. One, you absolutely hate it. Three, you are, you're okay, but maybe you have some lingering questions like some of the those that we were um, asking. Right. Give folks a second to do that. I'm seeing mostly threes and fours. I want to just show some of the cost numbers because there may be. Um, I know we need to still again look at these details. You all need to vet this and think about it a little bit more. So this isn't sort of done. I do want to, uh, yeah, show some of the cost numbers. So let me um, pull up the cost numbers that we have, if I can find them quickly enough. I'm not sure that I can find them quickly enough. Brittany, do you have right on hand the slide? I just want the one slide on water heat cost that we presented to the committee when they heard this proposal. Uh, or do you want to tell me where to find it? It's going to be in our SharePoint. I'll, I'll let Courtney pull that up because I want to um, review that just because I think this group might have ideas on other studies or resources that we can pull from on cost. Um, I think that, that some of it does come down to design, right? Chuck, to your point, if you're heating outdoor air with a heat pump that turns to electric resistance at 40 degrees, then you have increased operating costs. But heat pumps generally should be on operating costs at cost parity, on in upfront install cost um, with the right design at near cost parity is what we're seeing in the studies, right? But I wanna pull them up again and I wanna see um, if others have studies 
um, that reflect some of that. I don't know if anyone just has experience that they'd like to reflect on. You know, I know some of you have done systems like these on projects. Um, and that's okay. You can send it to us offline also. We will try to do some more digging and we'll send you what we do have um, in terms of sort of a literature review that the Brendel group did for us. That's what Courtney's gonna pull up now as a follow-up. Um, we, I would know that we're almost at time. I wanna just tag all of you to review the space heating proposal that we sent around. And so we took all of the bits of recommendations from the last time and made um, edits and changes. And I sent that to you on Friday. We are, we need your a review of that uh, by this Friday so that we can incorporate your changes in the space heating proposal before we send a final, hopefully final version back to you next week. So please review that and send us comments. If you would like to walk through the space heating proposal with us and kind of have a conversational editing conversation, I'm happy to schedule that. Um, but we hope that for your final meeting, we will be sending you what we think are final proposals. And we think we sort of need one more round of your review on space heat. So just email me or ping me in um, the chat here uh, if you want to have a conversational review of space heat. If not, we will look for comments in writing this week on space heat. Um, if you have any like sort of real substantive things that you think need to change after you look at it again, so that we send you what is hopefully kind of final on both proposals next week before your final meeting. And here is that um, comparison for water heat. You can see water heat is the last line according to a couple of studies for multifamily and for this is for small commercial, but that's the tank style, which is what we're considering regulating. Um, and you can see the upfront cost um, for multifamily was showing um, a 9% savings where the, um, and that was just the water heater cost, including all install cost in that particular study. And the operating cost should be 20% lower. Um, again, I'm sure that is heating, you know, sort of conditioned or semi-conditioned air, right? Uh, to keep the operating cost that much lower. And then for the commercial study, it did show that there was an increase in cost uh, for that small commercial uh, tank style. Um, and we just don't have as much data on commercial um, because I think it's the same system type as is going in on multifamily. Um, so that's what the studies that we have show. Would you, could you, Katrina, could you share those studies with this group through an email so we could look at those studies individually? Just yep. because if it is cheaper to install it and cheaper to operate, I'm very surprised that in the city of Denver, I am unaware of an apartment building that has utilized heat pump water heating throughout. So it just, it seems like the design community would have jumped on this ahead of time. So I, I'm just, I'm, those numbers seem, I don't know, they seem interesting to me. Thanks, They're Chuck. definitely awesome. interesting. Bye. Something we noticed is that the, the cost and the performance both improved dramatically in just the last couple of years. So I feel like the design community and contractor community are kind of catching up to the technological advancements and cost improvements there. And I'll send, I think Chuck, your question probably applied to both space heat and water heat. So I will send the, end of the actual studies behind this for space heat and water heat and this kind of summary slide um to the whole group so that you can uh, read through all of those i appreciate that yep and then and i'll also put in that the reminder to review the uh or or it'll probably actually come from courtney but courtney will put in the reminder to review the space heating proposal this week also if you have time or in the offer that if you want to meet with us we're happy to sort of walk through a review with any of you Okay, thank you all so much for your time. We're trying to really keep this to the four meetings, so that's why um, I think there were just a few things we need you to check coming out of the last space heating meeting. 
Um, thank you for so much for all your time. We'll have one more meeting of this group when we hope we'll, um, you know, get to what we think are kind of a final set of proposals. And um, but I think directionally, I'm hearing we're going the right direction. Maybe we want to check some of the costs a little bit more and some of the details a little bit more. So let's do that. Thank you all so much for the for all your time to help us refine these proposals. Right. This is easy. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye everyone.